things I would not do, I do uh, about his own personal struggles to live the way he knows God wants him to do. And then he gets into chapter 8, uh, and he gives us, I've, I've told you it's, it's such a victorious chapter, such a wonderful chapter. If you don't love the Bible, I hope you'll fall in love with this chapter, and maybe that will lead you to love God's holy word. <clears throat> As we've been in this chapter already, we've seen that uh, the law of the spirit of life uh, sets us free from the law of sin and death. He, he, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to live a life of peace. He's always there to help us try to conquer our flesh so we can live according to the Spirit. He's made us heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, in us uh, makes us, along with all creation, groan and are waiting for the final deliverance from this world of sin. And now in these two verses we have before us today, Paul's going to tell us one of the most important roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is how he helps us to pray. He is our great prayer partner. We're going to learn a lot today about prayer. I hope you'll take it to heart and let it change your lives. I'm reading simply verses 26 and 27, and here's what the Holy Word Bible says about this issue. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. Father, thank you for the presence of the sweet Holy Spirit in our lives. And thank you for the fact he led us to you, first of all, for salvation. And thank you for all that he does, that he set us free from the law of sin and death, that he resides in us to make intercession for us when we pray. And it's because he's in our hearts and lives as our intercessor that we can count on our prayers being answered in some way or another. I ask you, Lord, to help us today to glean from these two verses what we need to know and Lord, may it inspire our prayer lives to be greater than they've ever been in the past. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You like to have your prayers answered, don't you? We all like to fill out our shopping list, email it to heaven through prayer, and then, or maybe knee mail it to heaven, and then have the answers come down just the way we sent them up. It doesn't always happen that way, does it? Sometimes we get frustrated because it just seems like prayer does not work. So what's the point? Well, here we have two verses of Scripture that help us understand something about prayer that is totally integral to understanding the whole function of prayer in the Christian world and in the relationship of the human race to Almighty God. Now, I, I, we can't talk about prayer without establishing, first of all, point number one, that prayer is in our best interest all the time. Jesus said that his house will be called a house of prayer for all people. That makes prayer more important than preaching, singing, giving, anything else we do. Prayer in the house of God is vitally important. We're told to pray without ceasing. We're told to pray with thanksgiving at all times over all issues. Prayer is a very, very important thing. Jesus modeled the importance of prayer by praying frequently, getting alone by himself somewhere where he could pray and talk to his Father in heaven. And Christian friend, listen to me. If Jesus himself needed to talk to God the Father, you better believe you and I need to talk to God the Father as well. So it is in our best interest. The first half of verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. There are many, many cliches about prayer. One that I like really well is that prayer is how we get the power of heaven down to earth. Well, do we need the power of heaven at work on earth today? Or do we not? I think we need it now like we've never needed it before, in my lifetime at least. We need the power of heaven to manifest itself on earth, in the houses of God and outside the houses of God. We need the power of heaven. Uh, one I like best is that prayer does not change God, but it changes you and me. Well, you and I need to be changed. We need to be changed to, be, to live lives that are according to the very will of God. So it is always in our best interest and these verses teach us something that is really good for us. God does not benefit from your prayer life, but you do. And you can take that one home with you. That may be your takeaway for today. Write it down in your notes, in your bulletin, in the margin of your Bible. God does not benefit from prayer. You do. And so that's why we need to pray. It, learn, it behooves us then to learn this lesson concerning one of the most important elements in our lives. Now, if we understand that prayer is always in our best interest. There are two major hindrances to us fulfilling our best interest through our prayers. 
We're going to look at those just for a moment. One is given to us right here in our text. It says our weaknesses. We as human beings have weaknesses, and those weaknesses will hinder us from ever fulfilling our best interests through our prayer life. Weakness, it comes from a, a Greek word that means feebleness. Now, I don't know, you know, you, you've probably seen some people who you considered feeble, and probably as you looked at them, you thank God you weren't that way and prayed that maybe you would never be feeble, but weaknesses in this verse come from a Greek word which means feebleness. We are feeble in our prayer life. Uh, when it comes to morality, it, it deals with just frailty, uh, uh, both our mind and our body. We have a weakness, and the text talks about what that major weakness is. Now, we have many, but there's one really glaring weakness in the life of every believer. It's, said, it's talked about in our passage, but it's talked about more plainly, I think, back in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our major weakness is we just can't see things from God's perspective. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. Now, in that passage back in Isaiah 55, it's talking about how he redeems people who don't deserve to be redeemed, and he knows he's talking to people who don't understand why he would do that. But he says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. They're, my stuff is much higher than your stuff. And so that's one of our glaring weaknesses. We just can't get our mind wrapped around the enormity of God and what his major purpose in the world and in our personal lives is. We just can't get a grasp on that. We're weak in understanding that particular issue. And as long as we're weak in that issue, we're not going to have the kind of prayer life that we need. We're not going to be able to pray because uh, the way we want to. Then there's another thing that is a glaring weakness in the life of most every Christian I've ever known. It's our, our willfulness. Now you can say, okay, willfulness is a weakness. Well, okay, it is. But it manifests itself in a lot of ways. Some people who pray a lot pray incorrectly. They pray for things that are not in the center of God's will for people or institutions or whatever, individuals. They pray about things that just really are not going to get God too excited at the moment, and so they don't get what they're praying for. In James 4.3, this great writer gave a reason why people get involved in erroneous praying. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. We ask for selfish personal motivations. We want something to, that God to do something that's going to make our life better, more comfortable, safer, more prosperous, more fun, whatever. We want something for our own personal self-interest. That's willful praying. And God has no commitment to get involved in answering that kind of prayer in the positive way that you and I want him to answer it. He, he's, he's about giving us our needs and not always our wants. Now, you, you parents, if you haven't started telling your children this, you will later because they're going to want a lot of stuff that you can't afford or don't want to afford. You're going to say, listen, I take care of your needs, not your wants. And so you, you're going to say that a few times before you get those kids out of the house. Uh, God says that to us. That is erroneous praying. Now, listen to me just a minute. I've been very frustrated as a pastor all through my years of ministry in churches where we always had Wednesday night prayer time. And it, it used to be happen right here all the time. We come together and we take prayer requests. Oh, my goodness, what's on your heart? Oh, my Aunt Nellie's got a hangnail. Will somebody pray for her? Oh, Uncle Bob, he's got a little touch of lumbago. Will somebody pray for him? And, and, and they bring up all this little stuff. It may be big to them, but in God's eyes, in God's kingdom, in the worldwide eternal scheme of things, that's peanuts. And that's the kind of thing we bring before God. Is it wrong to do those things? No, that's not wrong. Pray about Aunt Nellie and Uncle Bob and get those hangnails and Obago stuff. You know, pray about those things. But don't limit your prayer life to that. My goodness. That's like asking a thoracic surgeon to trim your fingernails for you. It's just, it's, it just it, it belittles God. Pray about God-sized stuff. Pray about big things. World-changing things. God is enormous. Don't limit your prayers to somebody's personal, physical weakness. Yes, do pray for them, but don't limit your prayers to that. 
I have sat in prayer meetings, so help me, when one person right over here got one need in the life of one individual, and she'd take five minutes giving us every minute detail about what's going on. And of course, she's eating up prayer time, you know. Uh, you don't, don't do those things. Pray about things that are God-sized matters. You can't think of anything too big for him, can you? Don't worry him with things that are too small. Pray, not just to get your own self. You know, oftentimes when we're praying for some loved one, we want them to get well so we'll feel better about them. And maybe we'll get a chance to tell them we prayed for them. A little touch of self-glorification. Hey, you, you're well because I prayed for you. <laughs> no, don't do those things. Pray God-sized stuff. We have a nation, we Americans, that's going down the tubes. Morally, spiritually, legally, politically, every way you can think of, our nation's going down the tubes. Lift it up. God lifts up nations. God judges nations. We have a nation facing judgment. We have a church facing crises here. We, we're always facing crises. We're a, a mobile, transitory church. We have a new crisis every month when somebody goes PCS. Pray about those things. Erroneous praying is that which, if God fulfills that prayer, it's, it meets some personal need or, or desire in our life, but does nothing really to magnify the Him or to, to glorify Him or His kingdom. Pray about big things. Effective praying, there are several examples of it. Uh, I have two, one on the screen and one not on the screen. Uh, I want to read to you just a moment from John 14, 12 through 17. Jesus is speaking. This is about effective prayer. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, who, truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This spirit that helps us pray, that makes intercession, Jesus promised him and he said, he's going to be there to help you pray, but you've got to be praying in my name and you have to be obedient to me. Now, those are two conditions. Now, let me say this to you. Your salvation is unconditional. The love and the grace of God that saved you is unconditional. No strings attached. But once you're adopted into the family of God through that new birth experience, you're saved. Many of God's, and I could say almost all of God's promises have little strings attached. Jesus is saying, to get your prayers answered, first of all, pray in my name and be obedient to me as you're praying. Before you pray, an obedient lifestyle. Now here again, you may think back to your own days living as little children in your parents' home. I know it applied in mine. If I was not being a good little boy, there was no point in me going to ask my mama for anything. I wasn't going to get it. Matter of fact, I might get just the opposite. <laughs> you, you do the same thing with your children. If, you, if your children want you to bless them, they have to be good little children. If they're behaving, you'll, you're much more eager to respond to their request than if they're being little brats all the time and you don't want to respond to their request. That's just human nature. It's the same way with God. Walk obediently. Then when you call on your Father in heaven, he's happy to hear from you and he'd be happy to grant some of your requests. Pray in Jesus' name. Now, what does that mean? I mean, don't we always say in Jesus' name at the end of our prayer? Yes. Does that mean every prayer we pray is in Jesus' name? Absolutely not. I do wish it was just that easy, but it isn't. In the days in which the Bible was written, to do something in someone else's name meant to do it with the same integrity, the same concerns, the same emphasis, the same character that they would do it, have the same motivations, do it in their name. It's like power of attorney. <laughs> You've got this Limited power of attorney. You can go in the name of one person because you have this piece of paper. You can do the one thing that's designated on there unless you get that awesome uh, unlimited power of attorney, which means you can take over their lives and wipe them out if you want to. Uh, a power of attorney allows you to do something in someone else's name. Well, Jesus has given us an unlimited power of attorney to do a lot of things in his name, but when we pray, we should understand if Jesus was kneeling beside me right here, right now at this very moment, would he be praying about the same thing I'm praying would his motivations be the same as my motivation? Is this what Jesus would be talking to God about at the moment if he was here with me right now? And if you ask yourself those questions, it'll change what you pray for. Believe me, it'll change how you pray. Jesus understood that there'll be a lot of prayers 
set up to heaven that the Father just cannot say yes to. He understood that. And he modeled how to handle that in his own prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was arrested. You know the story very well, but here's what it says in Luke twenty two forty two 42 in that one account. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Father, I don't want the sins of the world dumped on me. I have never touched sin. I have never committed sin. I don't know sin. I do not want all the filthy sins of an entire world dumped on me. Take this cup away, Father. That was his prayer. That was his desire. But then he followed it with these famous words. And I, when I, I have a sermon and lesson I teach about the five most important prayers in the Bible. This is number five, the, the one that's the top of the charts. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now that should be the attitude of every person who ever approaches God in prayer. I'm going to tell you, Father, what I want. But at the end, I surrender myself to you. Understanding that what I am asking you for may not be in your will for my life or for the lives of those for whom I'm praying. And so I submit myself to you. Whatever you do as a result of this prayer, your will be done and not mine. That should underscore all of our prayers. And you know, people, I've, I've had critics of the Bible say, well, you know, Jesus prayed the cup would pass from him. God didn't answer that. Yes, God did. He answered the second half of it. My will be done, not yours, son. And so he answered that part. And if you will underscore all your prayers with, Lord, not my will, but yours be done, part of your prayers are going to get answered in a positive way because God's will is going to be done. Ultimately, that's just the way it works. Well, we have our best interest. Thankfully, in the second half of verse 26, we have uh, words about his beneficial intercession. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, there are times when you read things in the Bible where you come across just a little gob of words. You just ought to stop right there and say, now, what in the world does that mean? And you should meditate a long time about what that means. The Spirit himself, that is for emphasis, that is to hammer it home. God, the Holy Spirit himself, makes intercession for us. Subpoint number one under this is what intimacy? What intimacy? The Greek word translated makes intercession means this to lend a hand together with at the same time with another. Come right alongside, join in, and a very close, intimate partnership, cooperating, he makes intercession with us. This, this Greek word is used only one other time in all the New Testaments. In Luke 10, 40, where Martha said to Jesus concerning her sister Mary, therefore tell her to help me. You remember the story? Martha was serving. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's concerned. she got all this work to do here. Sets Mary over here meditating, having worship. She's just in Shangri-La, and I'm up here in the kitchen working. Lord, tell her to get up, get in here beside me, join in what I'm doing, and help me get this thing done. That's what the word means. Get her involved with what I'm doing. Make her get up and stand beside me and help me. Well, this is what the, the Holy Spirit does. When you and I are praying, he comes right alongside us, and he jumps right in and participates with us. What intimacy is involved in that? And you and I need that. We need that. We need the Holy Spirit right there beside us. Why? Because we don't know how to pray for what we ought to pray for. We just don't know. We have that weakness. We don't know what's on God's heart at the moment. We just need to have the Holy Spirit come along and do some translating for us. And he does that. He comes along and he intercedes. And then what intensity with groanings that cannot be uttered. Our passage started out back in the first word in verse 26 was likewise, and it refers back up to the, where the entire creation is groaning, and you and I even groan, waiting for the deliverance, waiting for, the, for, for everything to be made new again. We preached about this a 
couple of weeks ago and, and you were here. I, I know you'll never forget that sermon for as long as you live, and that's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I know I'm a comedian. Uh, just as nature groans to be delivered from all the perils and all the harm that sin has done to it, and you and I groan in our spirits to get out of this world of sin, to get to a place where there is no more sin, he groans, but there's a little bit of something different. When the text talks up in earlier verses about nature groaning or, or the creation groaning and about you and I groaning, it does not say that our groanings cannot be expressed with words. But here it says the groanings of the Holy Spirit are so intense there are no words to describe them. They are inutterable. Oh, my I am sure you and I cannot even plumb the depths of what that means. When you and I are praying, the Holy Spirit is so intensely involved in our prayer life that the groanings that come from His great heart cannot find expression in human language. Oh my. That moves me to wonder about a lot of things. How about you? That moves me to wonder. Holy Spirit... Why are you groaning so intensely? And he may have several answers. One of them might be because you aren't. Somebody needs to groan over this issue. and You're not doing it. You're talking to God, but there's no intensity. There's no fervor. There's no zeal. There's no fire in your prayer. So I'll do it for you. Holy Spirit, why do you groan so intensely? Because you're bothering God the Father with all this minutia. He's sitting up there ready to do great and marvelous things and you're bothering him with these little nitpicking needs and desires. Talk to him about something that really is his size. Holy Spirit, why do you groan so intensely? Oh, because those prayers you're praying... If they're answered, they might glorify you or someone you know. But it wouldn't really glorify the Father. And His glory is my number one interest in the world. I'm groaning that something will come out of your prayers where if God says yes, He gets glorified through that answer. You and I need to have intensity when we pray. If someone comes to you and just in a kind of a monotone voice, kind of under their breath, just kind of, I'd like you to help me do something. You hear it, but kind of glosses over. But if they come and get you by the arm and shake you and say, hey, I need your help right now. Would you help me do something? Now they've got your attention because they came intensely. And with zeal, and they were excited about what they were asking for. Their heart was in it. Suddenly you're paying attention because if they care that much, I should care that much. I wonder sometimes how much God kind of tunes us out because the way we pray says we're not really that concerned about what we're talking about. We're not excited about these things. James 5, 16, the second half of the verse. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective... Fervent prayer. I think before God demonstrates how much He cares, He wants to see us demonstrate how much we care. Now, I think God cares about all the things we care about, but He may not demonstrate His care unless we demonstrate it first unto Him. It doesn't say the effective, feeble prayer of even a righteous man will avail anything. It's the effective, fervent prayer, the prayer that comes from the depths of our hearts and souls that makes God understand we are intensely desirous of this thing we're asking you for because if you answer this, you're going to get glorified. Something down here on earth is going to be better but you are going to be glorified. His beneficial intercession on our part. Our prayers go nowhere without the intercession of God the Holy Spirit. Now, later on down in our chapter, we're also going to see that Jesus himself makes intercession for us. We've got, you know, we've got great prayer partners. You understand that? God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Son. They're our prayer partners when we go before the Father with prayer. And we should do that. We should understand that. And we should ask ourselves, if they were kneeling here beside me, if they were sitting here beside me, would they be praying about the same thing I'm praying about? And let your answer 
God, how you pray. Verse 27 says simply his better intelligence. The Holy Spirit's better intelligence. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. First of all, the Holy Spirit knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows how intensely we want the things we're praying about. He knows whether answering that prayer will glorify us or glorify God or glorify something else. He knows if our prayer is kind of a spin off of maybe some kind of idolatry that's entered into our lives. He knows our hearts before we pray. You may have heard the story about a guy named Smith who went to see a supervisor in the front office and said, Boss, we're doing some heavy duty house cleaning at home tomorrow. My wife needs me to help with the attic and the garage and moving and hauling stuff off. The boss said, Smitty, you know we're really shorthanded. I can't possibly give you the day off. Somebody said, boss, I knew I could count on you. You'll get it on the way home. You may laugh later on. but He's asking for something, but that's not really what he wants. He really wants to be told, Smitty, you can't help your wife. Or she's on her own. You've got to be here at the office or here at the workplace. And, and, but he was asking for something totally different. I wonder sometimes how often we betray ourselves in what we pray about. We ask for things we really don't want. There's a little cliche that is sounded as a warning oftentimes. Be careful what you pray for because you might get it. And I believe that sometimes that may be why so many Christians have such puny little prayer lives. We're afraid to ask God to do something big and magnanimous because God might say, I'm going to do it through you, buddy. Let's get up and let's go, man. No, I can't ask you to do that, Lord, because I just don't want to come out of my comfort zone. I'm happy where I'm at. I don't want you to you know, do it with somebody else, Lord. No, the Holy Spirit knows our hearts. And if our hearts aren't right in what we pray, he's going to tell the Father, hey, psh, don't listen. They're not in on this one. He knows our hearts. I just got a book in the mail. It was in my mailbox when I came back from Switzerland. Got it yesterday morning. It's uh, by uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. It's about eight women, uh, a free book, by the way, <laughs> uh, eight women who underwent uh, severe persecution because of their, Christ their Christianity. And I started reading the first article. It's by a lady uh, named Gracia. She was in the Philippines. She and her husband were kidnapped and kept for about a year and a half by a Filipino uh, communist, I think it was. And uh, in the article, she's talking about um, what happened there. Uh, and she said, God always does what is good. People do not. God always does what is good. People do not. And sometimes in our prayer life, our prayer, as, 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 as serious as we may be about it, it's just not the right thing for God to do at the moment. God wants to do something bigger and better, and you not want to do something lesser, and, and, and he just won't do it. He's always wanting to do what's good. And the Holy Spirit knows our hearts. He also knows our Father's heart. He also knows our Father's heart. Grand old Bible commentator John Gill wrote this about this particular verse. Since it is the Holy Spirit that makes intercession, and the persons are holy for whom he makes it, that's you and me, and this is made for holy things, and all according to the will of God, which the Spirit of God must fully know, saints may be confident of the prevalence and success of such intercession. I'm glad the old man Gill chose those words. We may be confident of the prevalence and success of such intercession, of the intercession of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily yours and my prayer request, but whatever the Holy Spirit communicates to God as a result of our prayers, that is going to be successful. Now, there are several verses of Scripture to help us understand this. I'm looking, first of all, at Romans 11, 33 through 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgment and His ways past finding out. Or who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? You and I, when we pray, that we're going back to that weakness with which, which we started. We don't fully know the mind of God. We have a lot of it uh, translated for us here on the pages of the Holy Bible. And if you can find things in the Bible and pray over those, you found a real good way to get the Holy Spirit interceding in a positive way on your behalf. Pray about things the Bible tells you to pray about. But we don't know the mind of God. 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? 
Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. God the Holy Spirit knows exactly what God the Father is up to, what he wants to do. And somehow or another, whatever you and I are praying for, he's going to translate that into some way that God is going to have his will done through our prayers. And most often it will mean saying no to the things you and I ask for. Because it just does not fit his plan. He has a superior intelligence to you and me. The weakness that we have in not knowing the heart of the Father does not exist in the, in the Holy Spirit. He knows exactly what God the Father wants to do all the time. In that same book about the women, I'm sorry, no, this came from a, an article on, uh, on the Internet, a newsletter. A Nigerian pastor named Enoch Mark was well, some half a kilometer, about 500, 600 yards away, when the Muslim radicals of Boko Haram raided the girls' school in Chabok and kidnapped 276 schoolgirls just a few years ago. Those 276 schoolgirls included his two oldest daughters, Monica and Sarah. He learned later on, he and his wife Marta, that the oldest of the two had been savagely mur martyred by her kidnappers because of her refusal to convert to Islam. Boko Haram succeeded in convincing some 120 of those girls to put on the hajib and the burqa and all that stuff and dress and, and to actually give out messages to other Christian women to leave Christianity and come back to Allah. Uh, but Monica was not one of them. And she was savagely martyred. What they did was they buried her up to her neck and then had some of the other girls who had converted stone her to death by pounding her head with rocks. But the word came back to Pastor Mark and his wife Marta. Monica did not waver. She stayed true to her Lord. and She died a martyr. Pastor Mark said, I was told that my daughter refused to change her religion. Then he explains how they killed her. Then he said, to die for the sake of Christ. That's the happiest thing for me. I'm grateful that she didn't change her religion. She trusted in God. And Martha, the broken-hearted mother, said she still was not over the shock of having lost her daughter. Said she died with dignity. Monica is now in heaven because she refused to convert. Now you stop and think about this for a minute. Are we to suppose for a moment that this Christian pastor and his loving wife did not pray without ceasing for the welfare of their two precious daughters? Are we to think for a moment that what happened to Monica is what they prayed for? Absolutely not. Just like you and me, they prayed that their precious daughters would be returned to them unharmed, brought back to the safety and comfort of their Christian home, back to the loving arms of mom and dad. That would have been what they prayed for. But that's not what they got. Instead, they got a martyr for a daughter. And if you listen to the things that they said here, you know, we would have loved to have her back. But what we got, even though it was a total contradiction of what we'd been praying for, it was better than having her home. She died for Christ. That's the happiest thing, Pastor Mark said. That's the happiest thing. Didn't get what they asked for. But they got a daughter who clung to her faith under the most difficult of circumstances. When others around her had waffled and turned, she stayed strong. And somewhere as they were praying for her to be returned safe to them, the Holy Spirit of God was saying, I don't know what. He was interceding saying, Father, whatever happens to Monica, may you be glorified. Father, not their will, yours be done. And God gathered home another young saint, a martyr, one who died for her faith. Not what Pastor Enoch, Mark, and Martha prayed for, but they got something better than they expected. Because God was glorified. You and I want our prayers answered. I have a thing up here. Slide number nine, please. If, you're, if you spend any time in Christian bookstores back in the States, and that's usually the second place I go right after Cracker Barrel, uh, <laughs> Christian bookstore, 
You know the name Max Lucado. He's got shelves in every Christian bookstore full of Max Lucado books. One of his quotes. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. You and I want to be effective prayers. We will achieve that by tuning in to what God the Holy Spirit says to us. By praying in the way he himself would pray if he was kneeling right beside us because he is. He's right there cooperating with us, making intercession for us. Holy Spirit, what would you be asking God for at this moment? And then we pray that same thing as best we can. Or if we can't interpret it, if we don't understand it at the end, we say, Lord, this is, this is my shopping list. This is really what I want from the depths of my heart. However, Father, you first, me last. Your will, not mine, be done. And if we pray that way, the Holy Spirit who's making intercession for us will turn that into a successful prayer in which somehow or another, in ways that perhaps we don't know, you and I will be blessed, God will be glorified, and prayers will be answered. We have a great prayer partner named Holy Spirit. Lean on him when you pray. Father in heaven, feeble words, but I hope they'll incite fervent prayer in the hearts of the believers sitting before me this morning. There may be someone here today who cannot look toward heaven and call you father because they've not yet been born again into the family of God. You're their creator, but you're not yet their father. Lord, we pray that no one will walk out of here in that condition today, that this will be a time when I say, you know, if I really want to talk to God, I really want him to help me, I have to be.